Good morning or good afternoon. We are going to go ahead and get started with today's webinar on effective data presentations, called it Letting Your Data Speak. My name is Sonia Dublin. I'm a capacity building assistance provider here at Capacity for Health. We're actually funded by the CDC to provide capacity building and support services. So we do a lot of trainings and a lot of one-on-one -on -one consultation with organizations who are funded to do HIV prevention. And all of our services are free. We'll talk a little bit more at the end of today's webinar about how to access further capacity building services. But we do work around a wide variety of areas, including organizational infrastructure, so all of the support services to help organizations function, uh, like strategic planning and board development and fiscal management. We also do trainings and support around a bunch of specific evidence-based interventions and public health strategies, as well as a lot of work around monitoring and evaluation and helping organizations think about how to learn from the work they're doing. So today's webinar on presenting data falls into our monitoring and evaluation series. And like I said, we offer free individualized support. So if you have questions about the kinds of things we're covering today and how to implement them in your work, we'd be more than happy to talk with you and potentially be able to work with you more on that. And we'll have our contact information up again at the end of today's webinar. Just a few announcements before we get into our contact. You have all, um, onto our content, sorry. All of you have been muted automatically. There'll be lots of opportunities to ask questions. You can actually type those questions in using the chat feature or the questions box in the bottom right-hand side of your webinar control panel. You can also click on the raise your hand icon, and we can unmute you and you can ask your question live. If you want to do that, if you are listening to your audio through a telephone, you'll have to enter your audio PIN. Otherwise, we won't be able to unmute you if you do want to ask a question live. And if anybody is watching this webinar with multiple people around one computer, please go ahead and chat in your contact information using that question box in the lower right-hand corner. And that way we can make sure to include you on any follow-up. There's a, a document, an information sheet that goes along with this webinar, as well as the fact that this webinar is the third in a three-part series. And there's a bunch of information and resources from the first two sections that we will reference. And we want to make sure to be able to share that with you as well. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded. The recording of today's webinar will be available on our website, as well as an online training version of this content. So without further ado, I'm going to pass the audio over to our presenter today, Jessica Nantemeyer. I've had the pleasure of working with her, actually, for more than 15 years. But over the last few months, we've worked together around the development of this series. And so I'm really excited that she is here with us today to share her knowledge and wisdom and to share a bunch of ideas around how to present data effectively. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Sonia so kindly said, my name is Jessica Mantemeyer, and I am very excited about this topic. My uh, professional life began doing designing publications for a nonprofit, and so I did a lot of thinking about visual design, and now I am an evaluator, so I do a lot of thinking about data, and this presentation is where those two worlds come together. So we're going to be talking about uh, design and how it affects um, the presentation of your data. We're going to um, apply basic principles of visual design to data. We're going to talk about appropriate chart types and different techniques to create particularly strong charts. Um, and then we're going to move into talking about data dashboards, which is sort of a hot topic, all the rage these days. I just did a presentation at a national conference on schools. and. We had like 50 people in the room for a Friday afternoon conference, which is craziness, um, and a lot of people complaining about ineffective dashboards. So we're going to talk about talk about that a little bit later, um, and then we're um, I have pulled together some information that is, <coughs> excuse me, that is the the things that I think are important, the things that I think are really relevant, and then some things that obviously lots of other people think are really relevant, um, but. Uh, you know, a lot of this is self-taught, and I just spend a lot of time on the web looking things up and reading interesting articles and paying attention to webinars like you all are doing today. So there's a lot of resources at the end that will get you started on further exploration of this topic. We're going to start looking at basics of visual design. These are the basics that I find important. You can go on, on the web to find other lists, um, but they're all going to be about the same, and we'll go over the ones that I think are important and why. Look at charts. Look at data dashboards, as I already said. Um, top five things not to do. It's like those dummies books that have the list of 10 at the end. Well, I can only come up with really five strong ones, but we're going to talk about those today and then get a chance to reflect on the content, think about where, what you want to take away from today, and some, um, point you in some directions that you might want to explore. 
So, oh, I want to go back one second, sorry. You can see from our agenda, can you see from our agenda? No, but let me tell you that we're going to be exploring charts in Microsoft Excel, and I just want to remind everyone we're using Excel because a lot of people have it. We're using Excel for Windows uh, 2010 today. Um, that's what the charts were created in, and there's some screenshots from that. Uh, if you're using a different version of Excel, like earlier versions, or Excel for the Mac, we have found that if you're using different versions, things do look a little bit differently, obviously, if you're using different software. I um, encourage you to check out that help menu to um, find out where it is in your version. Okay. This is, as Sonia mentioned, the third in a three-part series, Basic Data Analysis, Intermediate Data Management and Analysis, and now... Um, uh, data reporting, let your data speak, data visualization and reporting. So we start today with the premise that you've got data that's ready to go. You're ready to present your data. It's cleaned, it's checked, it's sorted, you've got it ready. Um, and if you need to know more information about that, I encourage you to check out the earlier two webinars in the series. Also, you know who you're going to talk to and what you're going to say and why. So what are the program objectives and goals? What are your reporting requirements? You have an idea of where you're headed with the data. You've gotten the data. You've brought it to the place you need it to be, and you know where you're going with it. So now you just need to think about how to report and chart that data. Um, so data visualization is the, is the term for what we're talking about today. And there's a couple, you know, a lot of different definitions. It's a movement. It's a, um, it's a community. It's a, it's a, it's a goal. Um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure what I would want to call it, but it is the, it is the interest in the study of how to best present information so people can easily understand it. And one of the ways that it thinks about that is what are the ways that the brain works? How does the brain process visual information? So we're going to be talking about clarity and some brain functioning today. Um, really low-key brain functioning um, uh, in terms of why certain things work better than others in terms of charts and uh, design. Um, yeah. We're going to go ahead. You know a little bit about me now, um, my experience from design to evaluation. would love to know a little bit more about you all, so please. A uh, quick poll is popping up on your screen. Please. Um, Take a moment to let us know how you, how you would rate your own experience with this topic. So we're thinking about making charts, tables, and doing reporting of data. Um, please take a moment to pull in what best describes you. For those of you who are, uh, have absolutely never made a chart, never done a report, um, I really encourage you to, pay, to, think, to let soak in the information that, that we're presenting today, and then Keep in mind those resources at the end as a, as a place to start exploring. For those of you who have lots of experience, I really encourage you, as I've said before, this is my, these are my list. These are the highlights of things that I find important. If we're missing something that you have found really important in your work, in your experience, please chat it in. We'll put it up so everyone else can see. That would really strengthen um, the people's experience in this. And um, I mean, that goes for anyone who has any experience with charts if we're missing something. All right. Um, it looks like we do have a lot of people with a lot of experience. I really, I really do appreciate any um, additional thoughts or questions or, or feedback or additions to, the, to this today. OK. We're going to move on with the content. Sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty here. We're going to get get back in a moment. Um, the first stop, um, the, all right. Um, there we go. Thank you for your patience. Hopefully everyone can see basics of visual design and on item, a seven item, six item list. So these are the items that I find to be important, and we're going to go through them one by one. If you go on and look at visual design information on the internet, um, sometimes this list looks a little different, but you'll see very similar items. Um, basically, these different items um, 
help the eye unify or distinguish elements. So that's what I sort of want to use that as the frame. Lines help people distinguish elements for the most part. So separate one thing from another. My favorite kind of line is actually white space. Um, I think negative or white space can separate items really well and don't, aren't themselves busy, um, don't add to the busyness of a presentation so, or a report or a chart. Alignment is the next element that we're going to go over. And alignment, uh, like line, is, um, alignment sounds like line, it is the experience of having things line up to an imaginary line. And I, and it is a way to create unity in things that you're presenting. So the brain automatically thinks about lines around text or images or on a page. And if things aren't sort of lining up, it makes the brain wiggy, basically. It makes it a little confused, um, not really sure if things are supposed to go together or what's happening. Um, here you can see that we've got a few different elements aligned. The word alignment, the text underneath, and actually our footer line are all aligned. The title is not. That may be something I would have changed. Um, we see this a lot when people try to left justify, right justify, or center justify text. I find that people center justify with a little bit too much freedom. Um, it's, it's just hard for the eye to read a line of text, especially body text that's center justified, to get to the end of one line and return to the start of the other line unless that start is lined up or left justified. Another element when you're thinking about the design of something is what the typography, or for most of us, what that means is the font or the font style that we're using. Basically, there are two types of good fonts. Um, the serif fonts, which have that little doohickey at the end of their, um, of their letters. And they are really good for print. So right now, it's probably not good for how you guys are viewing this. But they're good for print because they help ground the letters and help the eye discern the edges of the letters. Sans serif which is the ones without the little tick marks at the end, are better for screen. And this has something to do with um, the way that screens are actually oscillating, which we don't consciously pick up, but our brains actually do pick up. So the serif is sort of an extra uh, piece of information that's oscillating in front of our eyes that doesn't work as well for us. So it used to be that we could say, if you're going to print something, do it in serif font. If you're going to put it on the web, do it in sans serif font like Arial. Um, but these days, most of us are doing work, most of the things that we do that people might print, a lot of people are actually viewing as PDFs, and they're viewing it on their screen. So it presents a, a challenge to this dichotomy. Um, and there's a whole world of people developing um, fonts that work with an understanding of that. And Calibri, which is in some of the current versions of Word, is a really good uh, example of a font that was designed to be good for both the print and the screen. When you're using, when you're selecting fonts, you definitely want to think about having uh, one or at the max two fonts in any given report, chart, table, handout. Um, and this just helps unify. This is a, a principle that helps unify things. If you go into Word and select a, a Microsoft Word and you select a theme, it automatically populates it with a couple of key fonts, a body font and a heading font. Often that's actually the same font, because they use color or um, bold or italics or font size to, do, to distinguish between the headers and the body text. Um, and that is perfectly fine. I tend to try to use just one font. Decorative fonts. This is the third category of fonts. Um, so we had serif, sans serif, and then there's all the other ones. Decorative fonts. Fonts convey a message. Please take a moment to type in what you think this font, which, we, which is called Jokerman, what this font conveys. Right, it looks like a party. Um, so you may be writing a report about something that is very serious, but um, if it looks oh, a sunny day, um, yeah. So uh, if you're writing something that's very uh, it doesn't really matter what you're writing about. You could be writing about something silly or serious, but what is the intention? And what does this font say about your intention? And what does this font say about the content of what you're trying to convey in the words? Here's another font, Kristen ITC. What do you think this font conveys? What is this font telling you? Is this what you want it to be telling 
your audience for your chart for your report. I'm getting juvenile, I'm getting not serious. That might have been about the previous one or about this one. I think they're both, um, they're both in that camp. You want to be intentional. Part of what we're doing when we're conveying information are our hard-fought data, our hard-fought evaluation information to our audiences, we want to convey it with a certain amount of seriousness and intention. And if going to a wedding is what you want to communicate, which is what I see here when I see this font, then that's fine, but you want to make sure that you know that you're doing that. So avoid decorative fonts. A social gathering, yes. Okay. A couple more elements of visual design. Color. Color makes things pop off a page. This helps you distinguish different elements. Um, color can also unify if you're using a similar a, a color palette that goes together, and, and a lot of software tends to have sort of color palettes that work really well together. They've pre-selected those for you, so that is um, a, a perfectly fine way to go. Um, but in this case, we've got color hopefully helping a word pop off the page. A practical note about color before I move on. Color drives up printing costs. So if you are going to be using color in any presentation or report, whether it's your inkjet printer down the hall or setting it out to be professionally printed, you want to think ahead of time about the cost you're adding to your, to your presentation or to your work. If it's on the screen, obviously there's no additional cost. Also, um, even if you intend it to be in color, a lot of people are going to be printing it out on black and white printers. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention to whether in black and white there's enough contrast between the colors you're using to, um, for people to really still be able to distinguish between the different elements. Which brings us to the next element of visual design that I think is very underused, which is contrast. Make things more different from each other if you want to distinguish between them. Uh, and the way I see this most often is people have their headers in 14-point font, their body text in 12-point font, and that's the end of it. Bump up that font size on the headers, lower the font size on the body text to 11-point just to help the viewer distinguish between the headers and the text underneath it. Here is an example of a kind of a flyer or a report that I have, this is not one I've actually gotten, I made this one up, but I've gotten ones very similar to this, where you can't really tell what the different elements of it are. I used color and contrast to distinguish different elements and alignment to unify different elements to make it just a little bit prettier. Um, so you know where the header is, uh, what the title is, you know what the headers are. The bullets are lined up and there's a footnote that you only have to read because it's really small if you're really, really invested in reading it. Finally, um, one of the guiding principles for me is simplicity. Let your data speak. Let your information speak for you. Don't bog it down with, um, with decoration, extra decoration. If you have any questions at any time, um, we do have someone here who's answering some questions. And also, I'm happy to answer questions live as things come up. Um, um, there is one question about SPSS, and I'm going to circle back to that in a moment. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, after I do a little more thinking about that. Uh, SPSS is not a good data visual. Actually, let me do that. I've done the thinking. SPSS is not a good data visualization software. It's good, for genera it's good for data management and data analysis. Really good for that, obviously. Much more robust than Excel in many ways. Although in my work, I often, we're often toggling back and forth. There's things that Excel does do a little bit better than SPSS. Um, but for us, what we do is when we do the analysis in SPSS, we print out tables that we dump into Excel and make the visualizations from Excel. So it's an added step, but that's how we do that. Please type in any other questions as you go. We're going to move on to different kinds of charts, second part of our agenda today. Different charts convey different meanings and are used for different purposes. If you want to compare the differences between people, members of a group, different elements in a group, obviously the, the bar chart here, the vertical um, bar chart, works very well for different categorical groups. And if you have more than one dimension of those, then the clustered bar works really well. Um, you can see, I don't know if you noticed, but on the first one we had percentages. But once you get into clustered bar charts, um, or clustered uh, column charts, rather, 
then you want to move out of percentages because people don't understand how to compare which percentage to which, which percentage, the percentage is what part of what whole. It's unclear. So we moved back to actual uh, ends here, actual numbers here. Briefly, how to do this in Excel. Here is a screenshot from Excel 2010. This is the underlying data table for the chart we saw on the previous page. Insert ribbon is where you go. And one of the options there is to insert a kind of chart, a column chart, or different. You can see the other chart options here. And you click, select the chart you want, and it automatically puts a chart into the worksheet. You can see that the underlying table is highlighted here in yellow and purple and green, it looks like. It tells you what the data range that it selected. And then you can go into, in this version of Excel, you can use, there's a chart tools option where you can go in and do lots of futzing with the format of the chart, and we're going to go into a lot more detail about what things you should futz with later. Um, but you also can right-click on any element and change it. Um, one vocabulary note that uh, for those of you who are new to working with charts in Excel, um, it looks at different columns of information, and it calls them different data series. So when you're um, clicking on different things, it might say format this data series. Um, and you have to format data series separately. So the two different colors here for the two columns are the default colors for the default chart that Excel put in here. But you could change those colors, but you'd have to click on each data series separately. You could add a data label where the number, that, which we had in an earlier version, which we might get back to. Um, but you'd have to do that for each series separately. It's one of the things that I find most annoying about Excel, that it can't do the series at the same time. Um, if you wanted to highlight one piece of information in this chart, you can double click on one of the columns and change the color in Excel pretty easily. So you can see that. You should be able to see that now on your screen. Um, so here we're using color to create contrast, to draw the eye to a piece of information that we want to highlight for our audience, the number of male respondents to a survey. OK, compare groups. Compare groups across more than one dimension. You'd use a clustered chart. Here, we want to show change over time. The go-to there is a line chart. So in this example, we've got two years, and we can compare one to the other across the 12 months of the years. One way to shake things up a little bit in, a, in showing change over time is to lay uh, another chart over it, which is actually within the same chart, you've created a different, a second axis and um, a separate, you've, you're using a separate data series, in this case three separate data series, um, to display additional or related information. In this case, these things are pretty closely related. So what we see here is 2011, the number of people who came um, were served by a clinic, in this case. And then we see the three major ethnicities, their relative proportions for each month. You'll see that there's two different axes. So there's an axis on the left that goes with the total clients and an axis on the right that looks at by race and ethnicity. And they have different, they're at different scales. Um, since if we added up the total ethnicities, these three ethnicities for a given month, it would actually still be less than the total client served because there's other ethnicities not represented here. Um, the two would look really far apart. So I changed this, the axes for the race and ethnicity data. So things sort of looked a little bit closer together, took up a little less real estate. Um, if you're going to do this, I really enjoy this because it presents, it's another way to present multiple dimensions of information in one chart. But you um, want to make sure that you're very clear with your audience that there are two axes to help them read it. Um, as always, please chat in any questions as you go. And in particular, let's talk about this pie chart. Um, this pie chart is a, is a way to show parts of a whole. OK. But let me ask you a question. Do more, did more Latino Hispanic clinic clients access the clinic or access care there than those who are um, categorizes ethnicity-owned terms, so folks who filled in their own term for their ethnicity that wasn't part of a preset list. Can you tell which one is the greater slice of the pie? 
And while people are chatting in their guests, um, Latino, Hispanic, or own term, I'll go ahead and answer one of the questions that has come up. Um, can you save a customized chart as a default? Yes. And we will talk a little bit more about that lately, but later. But in Excel, you can absolutely share a, save a chart as a chart template. And in a few minutes, we're going to talk about erasing non-data ink or maximizing the data ink ratio. And we'll get to a point where that's the chart template that I would save. And we'll talk about that briefly at that point. Um, so I've got Latino, Hispanic. Looks like Hispanic, but hard to tell. Um, can't really tell. Thank you. Yes, you can't really tell. It is Latino, Hispanic. That's 22% of the pie. Their own term is 19% of the pie. Um, and we'll get into more of this later, but the human beings can, can see distance or length pretty easily. We can process it pretty easily. Once we get into a second dimension area or a third dimension volume, that is really hard for us to understand what's going on in a chart. And a lot of charts use... Um, and in this case, angle is sort of a, in a pie is like area. And a lot of charts, we'll show this a little bit later too, a lot of charts use, show volume and area, but that actually is not anything to do with it. It's actually a length that is measuring the data, but the illusion of volume and area can confuse the viewer into thinking that actually something else is going on and see differences in magnitude that aren't really there. So one alternative to the pie chart is the stacked bar chart. So in this case, we're looking at the number of clients who've tested positive by ethnicity. And within each, we're looking at the number who accessed care or did not access care. So everybody either accessed care or didn't, didn't access follow-up care. Um, so it is parts of a whole within each ethnicity. So we're looking, that's a way to show um, parts of a whole and compare groups at the same time, dual purpose. If you want to show parts of the whole and compare groups in a relative way, you can use a 100% stacked bar chart. So you'll see here everything goes all the way across. But um, the African American um, clients are have fewer n numbers. 18 plus 60 is fewer than the white Caucasian clients. 39 plus 90. So, but in this case, when we've lined them up in a relative way, we can see that regardless of how many clients we had of a given ethnicity. African American clients were accessing follow-up care at a lower rate than every other race or ethnicity in this sample data. Um, I find that in recent versions of Excel, it's hard to find the 100% stacked bar. But if you hover over the different options, you can see here a little dialog box opens up that gives the name. I don't know why they don't just put the name under it. They don't, though. OK. If you're only showing a few data points, um, you actually might want to just put it in a table. Conversely, if you're showing a lot of data points, you might want to just put it in a table. Um, but the, the principle of simplicity and of uh, maximizing your data ink ratio, which we'll talk about soon, uh, necessitates that if you only have a few pieces of data, that you just show it simply in a table like this. One of the god fathers, grandfathers, something, some father, of visual, uh, of data visualization, the grandfather, is Edward Tufte. His seminal book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, I highly recommend everyone um, check it out. He is famous for saying, above all else, show the data, and for introducing the concept of maximizing the data ink ratio. So um, the data ink ratio basically is the ratio of ink in a chart or table that is dedicated to the actual display of data compared to the whole amount of ink that is used. Um, it's, the, it's also the proportion of graphic of ink that is dedicated to non-redundant data. So if, you, if your data is presented in a chart actually in a couple of different ways, and we'll see how that's done in a moment, you want to erase a couple of those ways and narrow it down to just one, according to Tufti. We're going to actually walk through a process of erasing the non-data ink, maximizing the data ink ratio. We're going to go from the chart that you see at the top of the slide to the chart that you see at the bottom of the slide. We're actually going to go past the one you see at the bottom of the slide in true Tufty fashion but um, and talk about why I would stop at the one here in the process of erasing the data ink. Um, and again, these charts were created in Excel. So um, the process and the terms that I'm using are specific to Excel and Excel 2010. But um, 
you should be able to find a lot of similar language or certainly similar process in other versions of um, chart making software. Okay. The low hanging fruit here is to erase the text boxes around the axis labels and around the legend or the key. So we're going to go ahead and just start by getting rid of that. That has no data in it whatsoever. And as we said earlier in the presentation, I like white space as a line better than an actual line anyway. Now we're going to remove some of the other information. Um, we're going to go ahead and remove the race ethnicity axis label because anyone looking at this chart should understand that that is what that vertical axis is talking about. So we're going to get rid of that, open up the space a little bit. Now um, we're going to remove the horizontal lines in the background of the chart. So the bars themselves are the horizontal lines that connect to the, the label for each bar. So why would we have the horizontal lines in there? Let's get rid of those. Um, that opens it up already quite a bit. The next thing we're going to do, and this is my one of my number one favorite things to do is we're going to adjust that horizontal scale. Right now it's got a number at every 10 clients, so 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. In Excel you can double click on that actual box that holds that piece of information and adjust the scale. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and do that so that it marks every 50. Um, that the major, um, it's not grid lines, it's something else, but the major division I can't remember the word right now, um, is now going to be every 50 and not every 10. Then I'm going to get rid of those vertical lines because I don't think I need them, um, especially because I'm leaving the data labels here, like the 13 and 30 in own term, um, as a way to help the viewer understand the information better. So the lines are definitely redundant information. I did also in this time, I removed the tick marks. There were still tick marks on the horizontal axis between the different race and ethnicity categories, but the tick marks are totally redundant with the bars, so we got rid of those. Um, now I'm going to have, I'm going to go to the next slide and I want to see um, how you get to, sorry, I'm looking at one of the audience questions. I'll come back to that in a moment. I'm going to move on to the slide and I want to see what you guys think I did from one slide to the next. What are the last things that I did? This is a chart that I actually feel like would be an awesome chart. Um, so what did I do in between? Please type those in. Meanwhile, I'll ask, how did you visually add the numbers onto the data points? In other words, the 13 and 30 on own term, I believe, is the question. Um, if you're in Excel and you're in chart tools, I use Excel for Mac, so that's part of it. Is like I'm like trying to translate into Excel for Windows. I don't recommend using Excel for the Mac, actually. Um, but there is in the chart tools, there should be a um, somewhere. It's a data labels for the data series. That's what it is. So if you use Help or something to find that, and then you can have it display them or not display them. And you can also display them inside or outside. So especially in a pie chart, you can have them inside the pie slices or outside the pie slices. Um, and I wish I could be more specific about how to do that, but maybe that is something that um, we can follow up with afterwards. So I, someone said that I removed the legend box, and I actually didn't, but I did float it around somewhere. Um, the box around was around before. Um, I moved the axis label for the, the horizontal axis up to the top because the horizontal axis and the legend together describe it as sort of a title. So I moved it up like it was a title. Also, pet peeve of mine, Excel defaults have the shadow and they bubble out the ink. They like have this weird gradient on the ink that looks like it's hovering over the page and then boiling out at you, bubbling out at you. I hate that. So I flattened the color, which is one of the actual preset um, it's, what, it's actually a quick button in current versions of Excel. Other people may feel differently about that. People like the gradient or like the shadow. That, I think, is totally personal preference. Tufty would say that's too much ink um, representing the data. It's redundant and non-data ink. Um, but that is, that is uh, uh, I, I, I feel that that is actually a matter of personal preference. Um, at this point, this is where I would save the chart as a template. Um, and you can do that in Excel. Um, somewhere. Again, I know how to do it in, in, in the Mac, but I don't know where to do it here. But if you do the help menu, how to save chart template, you'll be able to um, see it there. 
Here we've got the actual data has taken center stage compared to what we started with. And that is our goal. People can really look at this information and start to build their interpretation themselves. Now, if we were totally tufty e it, if we were totally following Tufty's principles, we might take it one step further, where we've really removed a lot of the extra information and increased the gap width between the bars to shrink the bars down to basically lines. Um, but I think this is taking it too far. And unless you're someone who's really, uh, unless your audience is really steeped in Tufty it will be hard for them to start interpreting if you take it all the way there. So we went from the top chart to the bottom chart. It is easier to read. It is easier to communicate the information. And ultimately, of course, what we want to do is have our programs be able to communicate their successes or their shortcomings so that people can start to talk about it and make a plan about it. Um, so we want to let our data speak um, and not have all of that extra data ink getting in the way. Looking at this chart, please chat in what you would change. One thing that you would change off the bat about this guy. I know you'd change something. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to chat those in at any time. We're closing out our time with charts specifically um, and with um, Edward Tufte's principle of maximizing the data ink ratio. And we're going to move into data dashboards in a moment, just to let you know. Um, someone typed in the title font. Um, yes, the title font is one of those, like, I don't know what, what it is. You can't read it. What does that even say? Um, the background is hard to visualize. Yes. Um, this is actually one where you've got horizontal lines at the major and minor um, divisions of data, which again, this is the same thing with those that I said earlier. I don't remember which one it is, but the major or minor grid, lo grid lines. Um, so you all are saying it's a gray background, but it's actually a series of lines that Excel puts in here. We're going to go ahead and look at the next, what we did here. Um, change the font to a more readable font took out all of those background lines, adjusted the scale, the vertical scale now um, has far fewer numbers. Um, there we go. Much prettier. My coworker did this one. This was lovely. OK, data dashboards. Oh, and more contrast between the data lines. Someone said that. Thank you for noticing it. One was in color and one was in, in gray, although if we printed it, it would probably <clears throat> That's a case where we'd have to double check to make sure there was enough contrast when we printed it that people could follow the line. Okay. Basics of visual design can be used to build good charts. Good charts can be used to build good dashboards. At the same time, though, you, you can make a pretty dashboard, but you also want to take a moment to think about why you've decided to use a dashboard and what a dashboard is good for. Um, and we're going to go through my favorite definition of a dashboard, and we're going to look at some examples of dashboards in this section. Please continue to type in any questions that you might have. OK. Stephen Few, Information Dashboard Design. He is the father of dashboards. I don't know if Tufti's the grandfather. He's one of the fathers here. Um, he wrote a very nice book on information dashboard design that I really enjoy. And he has a really great website. And one of the resources at the end of this webinar is a Graphic Design IQ web um, test that is part of his website that I highly recommend if you're interested in this topic. His definition, um, let me take a step back. Data dashboards are very popular right now for displaying information, charts in one spot that people can monitor. They've been very popular in the business world, which and they get updated daily or even in real time in the business world. And they're becoming more of interest to the social services and the nonprofit world as there's an increasing pressure to monitor our outcomes and our activities. Um, we usually cannot update them daily or in real time. So we're tending to update them monthly or maybe even quarterly. I would recommend that if you're updating something annually, that a dashboard is not where you want to go and that you want to think really clearly about it if, if you're updating it quarterly. Um, because they can be a lot of work and a lot of work to maintain. And so you want to make sure that they're information that is going to be very, um, that is going to be timely. 
Okay, which brings us to Stephen's FUSE definition. Dashboards are visual displays of the most important information. Okay, so they're the top level information. But this information is also must need to be needs to be actionable. So you need this information to achieve one or more objectives. You're not reporting on whether you've achieved achieved one or more blah blah blah. You're not reporting on whether you've achieved that objective per se. You're monitoring whether you're headed in the right track to achieve, achieve the objective. And it fits entirely on a single computer screen so it can be monitored at a glance. Um, and his point on that is that you need to, if a dashboard is monitoring high-level information that's pointing the way to further investigation that is actionable data, then you want to be able to look at it without having to explore and move any scrolling scroll bars. Um, I think that that is a, is a point well taken, but in the age of many different sized computer screens, I'm not always sure that we can guarantee that that is true. So my, my interpretation of his, indefin his definition is this. It is a collection of charts. They're updated periodically. As I said before, it's got to be, I think, quarterly really sort of the outside period that I would consider using a dashboard for, and I would strongly recommend that it works for monthly updates. Um, that it monitors high-level information because it points the way to further investigation. So people who um, are looking at the sort of um, the top of the iceberg because then they want to dive under and look at the whole iceberg. And they want to look at the whole iceberg because they want to do something about it. So that is the point where it's actionable. OK, a couple of design principles that we can pull forward from our design into our charts into dashboards that I want to review briefly. Proximity, things that are near each other look like they go together. Things that are far apart look like they don't. So close together unity, far apart distinguishing between different elements. Similarity, if you format charts in a similar way, um, with the same color palette in this case, so it's totally different kinds of charts. One's a line, one's a bar, the two in the lower right. But because they have the same color palette and they're close together, we know they go together, as opposed to the other line chart, which looks a little different, looks out of place, looks like it belongs somewhere else. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I hope that you guys have are able to see this, but there is a, a colored box behind the low, the two right-hand charts that enclose it, that pull it together, that say it is unified. Um, and that's the principle, Stephen Fuse's principle of enclosure. The principle of closure, we can see illustrated here because we have the vertical axis and the horizontal axis, but not the other two sides of the square around the chart data, around the bars. But we know that each, that these are, there are three separate charts here because those two lines and the, and the axis sort of implies closure around each individual chart. So this is an example of where the, how to distinguish between the charts and, um, and how to group charts together by using some kind of background or some kind of line around them. We could easily take the own term FTM, MTF, female, male labels, category labels, off of two of these and just have one define it for all of the charts, and we'd still be able to tell that there were three different charts here. And like line, like alignment, here we have a chart, two different charts that line up together that look like they go together. They have the same colors. They're lined up. The, um, what is that called? The horizontal axis goes across underneath both of the charts together. Let's look at an example of a couple of dashboards that I pulled off the web. This was just me searching on the internet for dashboards that I like. There's one, too, that, that my company worked on that I'll show you as well. And let's talk about the different principles that we've discussed and how it fits or not fits in the dashboards that we're looking at. This is one that um, is actually from the Microsoft website about how you can use PowerPoint and Excel to make an interactive dashboard. Um, what do I love about this? And I would love to know what you guys love about it, too. Um, what I love about it is the uniform color palette. I like that there's a lot of really good alignment here. Um, so there's um, 
there's one line, that orange line above the horizontal bar chart that doesn't track over to the teal line between the scatter plot chart and the column chart, which I would have changed myself, but someone must have thought that the colored um, column chart was more important, needed more space. Um, but everything else does a lot, a pretty good job of lining up. You can tell that there's a couple of different regions by the colors around them. They've grouped some things. Um, one of the principles of a dashboard, and I've heard varying uh, messages on this, but the basic idea is that the upper left corner is your prime real estate. So it's where we start reading on the page, when we're, especially when we're English readers. We start in the upper left corner. So, and then there's varying opinions about whether the lower right corner is also either a place that people spend some time focusing on, because that's where they leave the page, or maybe they are, um, or maybe it's the part that people spend the least amount of time on. Anyway, there's a, there's a jury's out a little bit on that. But um, in this example, there's a picture of Atlanta in the upper left corner. And I wonder whether that wouldn't be a better thing to move to the upper right corner or the lower left corner and put our key chart or our key piece, our most important piece of information at that prime real estate. Here's a dashboard I pulled off the internet by uh, Veronica Smith in Seattle. Veronica, if you're on this webinar, please raise your hand and let me know. I have no idea who Veronica Smith is, but I really liked her dashboard. Um, really good colors, um, really good uh, use of grayscale, actually, frankly. And um, she did something really interesting here where there's red dots and green dots next to about five of the different items here. So here's a note. I don't have a guide to this. I don't know what she means by the red and the green dot. She doesn't tell me, but, but I can infer that red means this is a problem and green means this is going well. So when you're creating a dashboard, you want to pay attention to some of the uh, ways that we understand different colors. And in general, red is bad, green is good, and yellow is neutral or slow or somewhere in between. Um, thank you, traffic lights. Here is another dashboard. Again, this one was also created in Excel. The previous one was as well. I like, I'm not a big fan of dark backgrounds, but other than that, I really like this one. Um, it's an interesting topic in and of itself, but also done a really good job of um, simplicity. There's just a couple of charts here, um, simple color palette. And in the lower left corner, there's a series of countries and several different charts about them that are all stacked up and lined up for easy comparison. So. Um, the sort of principles of proximity and similarity are working really well in that um, list of countries and some different pieces of data about them. I do not know what software they use to create this, but I do want to recommend the following website, flowingdata.com, which has an amazing set of information and examples of good data visualization. And I pulled this dashboard off of that. What I like about this one is that the, the, you can identify, you can clearly connect the different elements, the charts, the tables, the graphs, the map, because there's sort of a mirror image effect going on. Barack Obama's on the left and Mitt Romney's on the right. But they also use a color palette where all the green is Barack Obama and all the orange is Mitt Romney. So for that central graph, which is the cumulative contributions greater than $200 by week, um, you can see that Barack Obama green is doing a little bit better than Mitt Romney, at least as of when this chart was created a few months ago. So um, I really like the use of color to distinguish between the two different candidates, but the use of parallel structure to help people guide, um, guide them through parallel information for the two different candidates. Here is a dashboard that my firm created for a San Francisco agency that does a survey of high school youth every year. So um, if, you look, if you look up Youth Vote in San Francisco, you'll actually be able to see this on the web. It's on the web, and you can play with it and see how it works. This is not done in Excel. This is done in a software called Tableau, and I wanted to talk briefly about that. There's a wide variety of software out there for use in making dashboards because dashboards are so popular. A lot of them are made for, frankly, and Stephen Chu talks a lot about this, they're made for businessmen, and they look, and because they're called a dashboard, there's all these like dials that look like gas meters, gas, you know, full, empty or full gas tank meters in your car. Avoid those, by the way. Um, <clears throat> Tableau is really good. It doesn't suggest a lot of meters, which is nice. Um, and it's relatively affordable for nonprofits and government organizations, um, but it is not super cheap. 
So I would only recommend Tableau for folks who are really like getting into the business of dashboards or creating a dashboard. Um, I don't think I talked about this, but another, so dashboards are good for monitoring data that's being updated a lot frequently. They're good for monitoring lots of data at once. If you can pick out those five or seven high level elements that you want to put into a dashboard. And the other way I've seen them use really well is when you're working with a, a collaborative of people who all need to monitor the same information but don't necessarily need to meet every month or every week. Um, but then you can sort of put in everybody's high level indicators and monitor those as a group and it can forward, I've seen it work where it's forwarded community discussion where a neighborhood, or a series of neighborhood organizations put their information in a dashboard together. Um, but back to Tableau, it's expensive. If you're going into the business of using dashboards, it's a great, great, great software for that. But you want to make sure that you have the capacity to train someone on it and who can maintain it and help people interpret how to read it. Um, but here you can see we used nice, it, it comes up with these color palettes itself. It has really good suggested color palettes and a lot of different kinds of charts that you can um, use. We're not going to go through how to create a dashboard in Excel, but I wanted to show you a couple of key pieces of how that might work. Here is a sample dashboard that we modified from something that was about something else entirely, but we looked, um, modified it to be about um, visitors to a clinic. For those of you who are in intermediate data analysis, you'll recognize some of the Excel formulas that we used in that webinar or that online module here in this uh, dashboard. So, this is a drop-down menu where you can select different levels of information that you want to compare, and that is using a combination of VLOOKUP and data validation tools. Here, the same thing, this time you're selecting a date range. Um, dashboards in Excel are a series, are usually a workbook with a whole bunch of worksheets in it. So you dump your data in one worksheet, your raw data, update it periodically. Then there's a series of calculations that are done that pulls it forward into some sort of intermediate step, maybe multiple intermediate steps. And then finally, <clears throat> you have a worksheet that is your actual dashboard that pulls all that information using VLOOKUP, using IF formulas, using a variety of other tools, formulas in Excel, to pull it into a series of charts and other displays or tables of information. So here you can see, it's a little bit tiny, but you can see that there's a blue tab at the bottom that says Report. And then the other ones are um, daily, monthly, and charts. So those are the different, you enter the daily information, it, sums, it does some calculations on it at the monthly level, and then finally it does the charts for you that then get pulled forward into the dashboard. So here's an example of a formula that obviously is pulling from multiple um, worksheets. For those of you who understand how to read Excel formulas, daily exclamation mark means it's pulling from the daily worksheet, and monthly exclamation mark means it's pulling from a different worksheet. Um, both of which are different than the one we're in right now. And here's an example. Um, it's a little hard to read, I'm sorry. Again, we're in our different um, versions of PowerPoint, I think, here. But here's an example of a formula. It's got, it's, this is one formula. Multiple formulas nested within each other. That's the kind of formula people need to be able to use to create a dashboard in Excel. Um, so it does certainly take some technical expertise. Five things not to do. Pie charts. We already talked about that. Use a stack bar instead. 3D charts. These are actually only measuring length. We already touched on this briefly. Not volume or area. So don't confuse your reader by including volume and area. Use a clustered bar chart instead. My least favorite chart. Radar charts. Again, it's only measuring length. It's the length on each of those five axes. But because you connect a line and make a shape, I'm trying to think about how the areas compare one to the other. That's not actually what's being measured here. Use a bar or column chart, clustered bar or column chart instead. Do not accept the Excel defaults. Take the time to erase the non-data ink. Go from the thing on the left to the thing on the right. Finally, it's awful cute to use shapes instead of a line, but again, we run into the issues of volume and area. People don't, especially with this, this cute little clip art shape, where does it actually end? It's harder to read. Keep it simple. Please take a moment to chat in anything you want to take away from today. I really enjoyed putting this presentation together. I really love this topic. And in a minute, I'm going to show you some additional resources that you can use um, that, that I encourage you to check out. But I would really love to know 
what is the thing that you want to take away from today in your work? What is the thing that stood out for you um, from this presentation? And here are those resources, as promised. Simplicity is key, yes. Um, Microsoft actually has a wealth of resources on data visualization and how to use their charts. So if that's the software you're using, we definitely go there. Juice Analytics has prepared chart templates. We talked about creating a template in Excel. You can go to Juice Analytics. They have amazing charts, beautiful colors. You can download those templates right into your Excel and use them. Tableau is the software we talked about earlier. And then finally, that graphic design IQ that's like the third from the bottom, that is Stephen Pugh's website, and that's that graphic design test, um, test your graphic design knowledge that I um, really have fun playing with. I'm going to turn the mic back over to Sonia and um, to give you more information about Capacity for Health. Thank you so much, Jessica, for that amazing presentation. Um, as I said at the very beginning today, I wanted to just sort of close out by reminding people how to access some further support from Capacity for Health. Um, as she has said a number of times, and as I said at the beginning, today's webinar was the third in a three-part series. The recordings of the first two webinars, as well as online training module versions of all of the content, are available on our website. Um, and they're available on what we call our online resource library. So all of the stuff from this webinar, from the other two webinars that are part of the series, as well as tons of other materials around monitoring and evaluation, but also around organizational infrastructure, around evidence-based interventions, is all available um, on our online resource library, which you see the site for that on your screen. Um, and as I mentioned, we're also directly funded by the CDC to provide free support. So if you have questions about the kinds of data presentation tips that were shared today, or about managing and you know, analyzing data in general, which was what the rest of the series was focused on, or you need other support for your organization or your program in terms of implementing your HIV prevention work, please feel free to get in touch with me. That's my direct email and phone number you see up on your screen. There's also contact information if you go onto our website at www.capacityforhealth.org, or if you go onto the online resource library which is a HTTP, there's no www there, library.capacityforhealth.org. There's information about how to contact us for free individualized capacity building assistance. Um, so that is the end of our content for today's webinar. And if anybody would like to continue to ask questions, we're happy to stay on the line. You can chat them in using the questions box, or you can also click on the raise your hand icon. We can call on you, and you can ask your question live. So we will go ahead and stay on the line and see if there are any further questions. But thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. We really hope that you've been inspired and excited in the way that we are about data visualization. And please uh, feel free to stay in touch, as well as take a look at the resources that are on our online resource library. So we're not seeing any questions coming in at the moment, but if anybody on the line would like to ask a question, again, please feel free to chat in your questions in the questions feature or click on your raise the hand icon. We're happy to stay on the line to take some questions or to give some more individuated advice about your data visualization practices. All right, well, if we're not seeing any questions coming in, we will go ahead and close out the webinar. As we mentioned, the recording will be available online as well as the online training module version of today's content. Thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, we look forward to seeing some of your data visualizations in the future. <laughs>